have to have a live mic because This cat almost never does this, except when I'm on some kind of video session.
think he just likes to be on camera. I love your cat, Dirk. <laughs> I had a black cat once, and so it makes me happy to see him. Thank you for having him here. <laughs> well, it was 100% his choice. <laughs> But he's, uh, I have other black cats that are Bombay is what the breed would be. But this one, even though he's pure black, he's really a Siamese cat. He was looking directly at the camera. <laughs> yeah, he's a complete ham.
Okay, let's begin with the seven line prayer of Guru Rinpoche.
endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, know the world, else in many beings to be tamed, Supreme One, teach of all gods and men, Buddha, O destroyer, glorious, victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, O destroyer, thus, thus God, God fully and perfectly awakened in death. Endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, know the world, comes of ordinary beings to be tamed. Supreme One, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, O destroyer, glorious, victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth. You said, I am supreme in this world. You who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Your body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain. Bring the places in the three worlds, supreme protector to you, I prostrate. And dad with supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust. The rapturous one, endowed with knowledge, to you are prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, feel devotion like merits and good qualities. To the dust gone, I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, you need supreme ultimate meaning. To the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, while abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homes to the Supreme Buddha, homes to the Dharma refuge, homes to the great Sangha, to all three ever did our homage. To all worthy of respect, bound with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, in all aspects, with supreme faith that pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Through this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing, and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate my creators from the ocean of existence. Stirred by the waves, sickness, and death. Okay. Zima, you're on again, or it's working. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning was time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. Oh, my masters, my idams, and the three precious jewels, I offer you all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, 
please send forth waves of your blessings. Edam Guru Ratna Mandalakam Nira Tiyami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. Arya Bhagavati Prajaparmamita Hridaya Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. The study here at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on a mass of vultures mountain on Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomenon called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of a lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of a lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In this way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is. no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, Bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, Tayata, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasagate, Bodhisoha. Okay, 21 times. Ayata gate gate paragate parasum gate bodhi soha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, 
Well said, son of the lineage, it is like that. It is like that one should would practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you've indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivadi Putra, the Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. To fulfill the needs of all beings at their various levels of understanding, we request that you turn the wheel of Dharma, including the lesser and greater, common and extraordinary approaches. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's really perfect. You have a good, clear enunciation, right? It helps. Thank you. Perfect. So, um, we're using uh, the Zoom program now, I think, right? So, I hope everybody was able to get on just right. And, we're completing um, this month and into June our um, international uh, audiovisual <laughs> uh, production system. So um, by the time we're fully open, then we'll have uh, some flat screen TVs uh, in the Gompa and we have a um, production booth so that we can have uh, uh, the in-person and the remote teachings going on at the same time. And we can receive teachings from uh, other places. And it'll seem like the llamas are just right here. So thank you for people's patience and donations to have this come true. Also, um, We've been uh, painting the uh, exterior of Dona Darge. And uh, now it's like bright color. Um, it looks uh, closest to Guto Monastery in Dharamsala, um, which is very, very bright also. Uh, Guto Monastery is one of the tantric monasteries. Um, and uh, still currently where um, uh, Karmapa, I believe, is still uh, staying. Um, so it's a very uh, energetic place. And also painting uh, Dharma Cottage. And we have flag pole with flags. So by the time we come back in person, um, most of uh, the work will be done. We have Tara Shrine uh, and Shrine Table and everything. So very excited. So thank you for your patience. It's allowed us to do all these things. Mm -hmm. Next time, I won't be looking at a screen. I'll just be looking at a, um, an iPad or something like that. So actually, uh, people's faces will be I think even smaller, <laughs> but I'll know who you are. So I particularly appreciate people that are out of town uh, from Sacramento anyway, and uh, Las Vegas and Pennsylvania and <clears throat> the Northwest. So uh, it's fantastic. All right. So today we're continuing to talk about uh, one of the Buddha's first teachings, uh, one of the most profound teachings, uh, teachings of interdependent origination uh, as it applies to uh, the cycle of birth and death, the cycle of uh, our lives. And it's called sometimes the 12 links of the 12 Nidanas of uh, interdependent origination. So 
Uh, it's an attempt to talk about how uh, things appear, uh, particularly from the standpoint of uh, ordinary consciousness or from the standpoint of, you could say, mistaken consciousness. <clears throat> but we're also going to talk about how things appear from the standpoint of um, full awareness or Buddhahood. Because in uh, our temple here, I, I like to cover both sides. So um, we have a complete teaching <clears throat> uh, so that we start, in a sense, uh, from the highest standpoint, start from the great uh, perfection or great completion style of presentations of Chen style. Uh, and we also start uh, simultaneously at the foundational part. So um, we're looking primarily to be in the, in the great Madhyamaka, the Maha Madhyamaka, the great middle way, which sees the simultaneous rising of both samsara and nirvana. Sometimes I liken it to uh, we're, we're sitting in the lodge, but uh, we also see the summit at the same time, right? So you have to see the summit. You have to, you want to know where you're going. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't know if there's a lodge uh, at the foot of Mount Everest. Um, there's some kind of base camp, but you, you can see the summit, right? But then the path uh, is, uh, becomes extremely important. <clears throat> So uh, Yona Dargi at the temple here, we want to cover our present situation uh, of uh, stuckness, and we want to cover the uh, experience of liberation and bliss and uh, total awareness, and also uh, we want to cover the climb right, like that. <clears throat> Sometimes it's nice to just stay in the lodge and uh, or stay in our uh, cave or suffering and just uh, gaze at the summit and um, read about uh, other people's journeys, right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I like reading biographies uh, of practitioners and current um, biographies too. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, I have a fantasy like, oh, I could do that. <laughs> But I usually when I think about it deeply, um, I probably couldn't, you know, be sitting in a cave for uh, six years or 12 years. I, I probably couldn't do that. So I, uh, even when I was at Sarah J, um, I was a little older than usual. Um, so on the bed, uh, they have uh, just this little thin uh, mattress, right? <clears throat> on, on basically a really uh, completely hardwood bed. <clears throat> Maybe some of you like a really hard mattress, but this is like sleeping on the floor. So um, I, uh, I was just kind of tried it for a month and then couldn't do it. And finally I said, I need another mattress. And I uh, told the, um, one of the teachers there, <laughs> And like they rolled their eyes and go, this is typical American, like actually wants another mattress. Um, it was totally kind of a gutsy kind of thing to do because uh, actually monastics aren't supposed to sleep on comfy beds, but I was miserable. So um, <laughs> uh, we had to walk into town. There's uh, an Indian town. Uh, it's funny, there are two, there's a Tibetan settlement a regular Indian town and Sarah and um, the Nyingma monastery are kind of squeezed in between. So you have to walk into town and then you have to walk back with the mattress on your head. So everybody in the whole place knows, okay, uh, Lama Jimpa is this American Lama who needs uh, an extra mattress. It's really embarrassing, um, but I used it. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that, I just joked that I, I was in misery. I was willing to walk the path and actually carried the mattress <laughs> on my head. And then I enjoyed the bliss of liberation and a good night's sleep after that. So 
and doing the Dharma practice, uh, we have to speak the truth, but also sometimes we have to be willing to um, be a little bit awkward or embarrassed. Um, everyone can see our problems in our wards, right? Like that. <laughs> What we're talking about is the um, the link um, uh, called uh, contact or sparsa. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we've still got a ways to go because um, this is link number six and there's 12. So I hope you're not getting bored with interdependent. <laughs> and origination. So <clears throat> contact, you know, formally is when the, uh, the I and the I consciousness and um, the object, uh, you know, finally come together. So uh, this is talking about how we form our perceptions, how we come alive, what uh, you know, ordinary life looks like is we uh, break it down into this and I, and it's something we're looking at, but we also have to have uh, the eye consciousness. As you know, we can be looking at things or uh, the eyes are open, ears are open, but since we're not paying attention, since it's not a consciousness, we actually don't see it or hear it, right? So those three things have to come together. <clears throat> So what's the purpose of breaking these uh, things into these parts? Well, um, the whole purpose is uh, basically uh, an Abhidharma purpose. Uh, an Abhidharma purpose, um, as people will learn when uh, Elizabeth Zeem and I do uh, presentations, is uh, to make things manifest, to make knowledge manifest, realization manifest, to uh, learning to distinguish uh, what's actually there, to distinguish the dharmas. <clears throat> and what's what's there from Abhidharma point of view are uh, these dharmas or true experiences um, along with uh, uncompounded and compounded dharmas along with useful or healthy emotional attitudes along with unhealthy emotional attitudes but, uh, and there's the five skandhas that um, a while back, maybe last year at this point, I don't know, Dirk went into. So what's not there from the description is what? No Atman. Didn't, didn't find a permanent identity existing from its own side that regards itself as special and powerful and owns the rest of things, right? Buddha said, I didn't find that. So the Abhidharma is an attempt to talk about what uh, uh, actual experiences, what actual um, dharmas uh, the Buddha did find uh, and how they're organized and how they can help us in our, our practice and liberation. So uh, many people, uh, uh, that I'm talking to today probably haven't done much uh, study of Abhidharma and I've left it to the end because uh, it's, it could be getting lost in the uh, thicket of nettles if you not don't approach it correctly. <clears throat> the, there's Pali Abhidharma and there's uh, Theravada Abhidharma and then there's uh, the Abhidharma uh, that we use in uh, Mahayana that comes from Asanga and Vasubandhu and some commentaries on those. And uh, then uh, actually uh, Jimmy Pam, uh, uh, who I'm fond of quoting, actually uh, put together uh, his own style of Abhidharma too, right? So that's been translated into English. Um, and I know Dirk knows that uh, uh, by uh, in Eric Pema, so 
Shanti. Shanti, do you know the translated name in English? Derek, what, what's the translation in English of Nippons? I so, think it's Gateway to Knowledge, but I might be confusing it with a different book. That's true. No, that's true. Three volumes like that. That's right. Pardon me? Abhidharma means to make uh, the truth manifest. Gateway to Knowledge is a uh, text by Nipam Rinpoche. So um, that uh, talks from Abhidharma point of view. Abhidharma point of view is uh, learning how to distinguish uh, what uh, true experiences are from untrue experiences, how to use our prajna and discriminating wisdom <clears throat> so that we can uh, ably communicate not only to ourselves, but to others uh, what's going on. We use some words in a very general way, um, but when we're doing actual uh, yoga and meditation, actually doing investigation of our body and mind, uh, we need to know our uh, anatomy, so to speak, right? So if you go to a physician or a massage therapist, uh, you might just say from your side, oh, my back's hurting or I have some stiffness in uh, my shoulders, um, but um, a physician or a massage therapist needs to know like, oh, that's, uh, you know, a problem here. Uh, that's a problem with this uh, muscle or that's a problem with this organ. Uh, we need to know the details. So you can't just say, um, you can't send someone to surgery just by saying, oh, they have some stomach problems. You know, you don't, you would have to already do a workup saying this person needs an appendectomy. You would have to know where the appendix is or this person uh, needs a new heart valve, you would have to know the difference between the heart and the lung, right? <laughs> so uh, when we're talking in general ways, uh, we're talking about um, uh, pointing in the right direction, but then uh, after pointing in the right direction, we wanna know the specific path. So that's why Buddhist yoga and uh, meditation uh, for professionals, which is what we wanna be, gets actually very specific. <clears throat> um, because we want to be professionals. So if you go to, um, you know, optometrist or ophthalmologist, um, you want them to really know about the anatomy of the eyes. And so uh, a couple of years ago, I started getting some migraines and um, getting those jagged uh, things that happen in your eyes, you know, some flashing and jaggedness. Uh, so uh, I went to the Kaiser ophthalmologist who was very good. Sometimes I, I'm critical toward Kaiser, but actually Kaiser also has some very good physicians. So I, um, but uh, like an optometrist, she examined my eye, but uh, then uh, I was used to that. But then she took out like a, um, some kind of long kind of butter knife kind of thing. And <laughs> she said, okay, now I'm, I'm just gonna move your eyeball a little bit back. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, it, like, just stick it in there, you know? So I, I wanted to really know that, um, I don't know, you know, it was kind of insulting, but I said, um, you know, just kind of uh, uh, what, what we'd say in the spontaneously, like I said, I hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> and uh, she was totally cool. She's actually, uh, you know, she laughed too. I mean, she's used to that. So yeah, I, I don't study the anatomy of the eye, right? So <laughs> it's nice, you know, and, you know, I, I felt kind of vulnerable and kind of open, you know, so like that. So, uh, when we're giving teachings, when we're helping others with things, uh, if someone's asking us directions, that we won't just say, um, oh, you, you know, it's just kind of over that direction. Or if we wanted to go to San Francisco, you wouldn't just say, well, just drive west, right? So we give people specific things. 
<clears throat> so uh, that's the kind of approach and why the Buddha uh, broke things down into this chain of cause and effect, because that was one of the uh, uh, primary ways that uh, we realize uh, the nature of uh, particularly relative mind and get out of the delusional mind as things that are delusional don't uh, uh, have a cause and effect uh, correctly. Uh, and when we know the cause and effect correctly, then uh, we are freed. So um, if we go to a physician and he said, I, you know, uh, I think I swallowed like uh, a marble. Um, they would ask us, you know, like, why were you playing with marbles? And if we said we weren't playing with marbles, it just then we then the doctor would say we don't have a marble, must be something else, right? So we don't have the cause, so we wouldn't have the effect. It's kind of simple like that, kind of childlike. So that's why with contact, I'm trying to say that a wise person would be able to see how an object and a sense base like an eye and a consciousness have to come together to have uh, the beginning of an experience. So if they're not coming together, if they're not causes that go together, uh, you're not having a real experience. <clears throat> We should let that sink in a little bit, right? <clears throat> or we might be having some kind of experience, but it may not be an experience that we could label as uh, an experience of the I, right? Uh, I'm very really fond of um, the past uh, professor and Dharma student. Um, <clears throat> I've quoted from before. <clears throat> Stephen Goodman passed away like last year. <clears throat> so uh, he studied with uh, Herbert Gunther, Dr. Gunther, I studied with also. And um, Dr. Gunther was um, a longtime student who wanted to make sure we brought all these categories and uh, anatomies back to lived experience because that is our ultimate goal. If uh, it's not a lived experience for us, it's not gonna be liberating or freeing. So uh, I'd like to read a little bit from uh, Dr. Goodman uh, to honor him. Uh, so uh, I don't have to say it incorrectly. Can you bear with me for a moment? Yeah. Is everybody on the screen or are there more people than I can see? Mm. So uh, there's some people you, they would they would be hidden, right? Yeah, so you're sort of trying to flip back and forth. You're flipping back and forth. Okay, yeah. good. So Responsiveness, a dynamic and variable function, is an essential characteristic of being human. So this is a really important step. Responsiveness, a dynamic and variable function, is an essential characteristic of being human. To be human is always to be in a situation. The experience of one situation after another is one's lived world. We do not use the world here in the conventional sense of that outside over against us, which I stand, an abstracting dualism invoking the ghost dance of Cartesian res cognitans and res extensa, but rather in the sense of one's realm of lived meaning. Every situation then is in one way or nothing but one's experienced narrowness or limit of meanings. This narrowness, which often entails confusion and bewilderment, is for most people the predominant modality of responsiveness. Stated differently, one might say that much of people's experience is marked by general and seemingly pervasive unsatisfactoriness 
this observation constituted Lord Buddha's first true sutta. Unlike those who hold that miseries are but random happenings in an indifferent universe, Lord Buddha observed that there's a regular patterning to this misery. This observation constituted the second truth. Insight into the nature of this pattern of unsatisfactoriness is a central concern of the teaching of the Buddha. Buddhists believe, along with certain enlightened trends of pragmatism, that a person can do something about the quality of their life. This doing, however, is not so much just another action among many, but the development of a penetrating insight which is appropriate to the situation at hand. This insight, prajna, has a dynamic and incisive quality whose tone is always appreciative. It has nothing to do with the development of a cold, searing logos, carving out larger and larger chunks of a passive world, which as a prominent feature of post-industrial society caused Nietzsche to comment, in every desire to know, there is a drop of cruelty. Instead, the development of prajna is applied directly to one's experience. It may be focused as an analysis of perceptual and cognitive situations, an analysis which always has a preeminently soteriological function. It is only developed for the purpose of cutting through the patterns of habitual unsatisfactoriness. All attempts to reduce Buddhism to descriptive psychology or mentalistic philosophy must be likened to saying, for example, that Van Gogh's painting of sunflowers is just so many grams of cadmium yellow on a piece of canvas. We are presented then with the assertion that the best way to do something about the quality of our lives is to develop insight, analyze those situations in which we find ourselves. Various techniques have been elaborated in the course of time to help those who earnestly seek a way out of bewilderment and frustration. These methods are always intended as pointers, suggesting the possibility of taking a new look at one's predicament. They were elaborated and developed for the sole purpose of helping one to discern the difference between those modes of being which lead to further entanglement and misery and those which lead to increasing clarity. Attunements to reality shorn of all fictive notions and convulsive emotivity. To the extent that we develop insight, the experienced narrowness of meaning is severed and a tendent feeling of calm ensues. The most radical severance gives rise to the broadest, broadest expanse of experienced meaning termed Buddha Sangye in Tibetan. Buddha does not refer to any person as such, but rather to a dynamic mode of being in which the most intense responsiveness possible is actualized. The possibility of severing one's habitual narrowed experience was Lord Buddha's proclamation of the third truth, nirvana or sensation. The careful and systematic expansion of meaningful horizons is what is commonly termed the path. The demonstration teaching of the systematic expansion was the proclamation of the fourth truth, marga. These four truths constitute the core of Buddha's message to his fellow human beings, a thoughtful and serious reflection on the implication of each of the truths might constitute the decisive step in entering into the opening and deepening of experience. So, uh, Dr. Goodman is trying to set up that um, uh, these links, um, uh, of course, metaphor, but they're patterns of experiencing in which we find ourselves. <clears throat> and they're meant to uh, not be information, but meant to uh, return ourselves uh, to our actual lived experience. <clears throat> so there's uh, a way that we entangle ourselves when we have 
our experience and there's a way that we untangle ourselves from uh, dilution of experience. Um, that's the purpose of going through uh, this interdependent origination. So most of the time, the contact, uh, when we finally uh, connect with our world, uh, creates another situational pattern called feeling, right? Which would be the next link. And then the feeling, uh, which would be pleasant or painful or neutral, then uh, will lead to another one after that. Does anybody know what that would be after uh, the feeling? What do you think the next uh, pattern of entanglement would be? Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> Someone's raising their hand. Yeah. So uh, after uh, the feeling tone becomes uh, Trishna, what do you think that is? Craving, right? Mm. We, we can crave either more or less. So the situational pattern uh, at this point is becoming more and more constricted, isn't it? The field uh, is becoming more constricted. So how could we break the chain? How could we liberate it? Um, could we liberate it at the standpoint of craving? Yes, we could. We could say, I don't want to crave. Could we liberate it at the standpoint of uh, <clears throat> Contact, could we do that at that point? Yes, we could liberate it at that point also. So what would enlightened contact look like, Sparsa? What, what would it be like when we have uh, hearing and seeing and we're aware of it and uh, it all comes together? What, what would enlightened contact look like? Yeah, it could be open and spacious. So um, <clears throat> what, what would that look like, you know? Sometimes uh, the, the greatest uh, clues, you know, are to work with kids. So uh, Sangha member described this week, uh, just walking down maybe Midtown or something, walking by a child with their parent and the kid just said, hi, <laughs> just like that, you know, uh, and very uh, spontaneous, right? Just completely, uh, I'm sure that, you know, there wasn't any uh, aftertaste, right? Just, hi, here's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> and we could respond, hi, how are you, how are you doing, right? <clears throat> With the child, they, uh, uh, are going to have this uh, awareness, but uh, it hasn't fully developed so that they have both the uh, spontaneous awareness and the possibility to discriminate at the same time, right? They, they may, not, uh, may not be appropriate to say hi to a stranger or they uh, may not be able to reflect. But if we have uh, uh, a mind that has both the ability to uh, spontaneous uh, uh, manifestation and awareness and can reflect on it, then we have both partner and jhana. We have a full experience, don't we? It's very liberating like that. <clears throat> so uh, Dr. Goodman liked to point out these uh, styles of, or patterns of awareness or patterns of entrapment so that we could notice them not just in our meditation experience, but in our daily lives. But it's necessary to have uh, the vocabulary, the prajna, the uh, discrimination to notice like, oh, that's, that's when this is happening. Oh, that's an example of this unmediated pure experience. Saying that's an example of unmediated pure experience is itself uh, takes some uh, recognition. It takes both uh, uh, 
uh, awareness that is non-discriminatory and awareness that is discriminatory like progeny, right? We need to have both. <clears throat> so that would be an example of just kind of, uh, you could say enlightened contact, you know, just <laughs> hi, hi, <laughs> you smiled, you know, they smile, you smile, just, just like that, right? <clears throat> Wouldn't it be nice if everything was like that, right? But uh, we know we need to see how to undo, how to uh, take the kink out of our garden hose, how to unravel uh, narrow or fixated awareness, and also how to uh, recognize, uh, you know, the pure awareness at the same time, don't we? So as Buddhists, sometimes people get a little bit like um, to pathology oriented, maybe, um, always noticing where they're going wrong or where they're stuck. But that's, um, that, that would be um, not a good idea because then you become um, <laughs> a depressed Buddhist, you know? That, that should probably be like um, a new category in the DSM, right? <laughs> so that's when people are too uh, too focused on uh, samsara, too focused on what's going wrong, right? So that's why I say we, we have to be in the middle. Uh, we have to both see the horror and the beauty simultaneously. That's um, uh, our practice from the standpoint of uh, great completion, right? So it's already like noon. And um, I'd like to see if we can have some discussion um, and uh, people might have some examples of uh, sticky contact and they might have some examples of uh, liberating contact I'd like to hear about. Well, if this has been some discussion about what the book you read that from, could you maybe read a little of that book? Uh, it's probably out of um, print. That's part of that crystal mirror series, um, one through th three that was published by Nyingma Institute in Berkeley. And uh, you can still get that. It, it's still in print. Still it. Oh, good. So uh, Dr. Goodman's uh, article in there is called um, <clears throat> Situational Patterning, Pratitya Samadpada situational patterning. So like uh, Dr. Gunther um, and myself, uh, he um, liked to do a lot of reading in uh, phenomenology um, and existentialism and uh, uh, process uh, theory like that and um, uh, neurological kind of work. Um, uh, and I think he and Dr. Gunther accomplished that without um, uh, making Buddhism just into another form of psychology. So using Western psychological and Western terms to make it understandable uh, to a new audience, but at the same time staying true to uh, the realization side, I think is quite difficult. But I, I think people would find that article useful situational patterning. Uh, we had a question and then Karen. Yes. Dirk? Did he say Dirk? He did. <laughs> Pretty hard to hear what Connor's saying. Well, I don't know if I can give you examples, uh, but but you're you've mentioned many times that people tend to focus on 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 what they're doing wrong, which I confess is always been one of my habits uh but i uh also while you were saying it today i realized that you never learn a skill by focusing on only what you did wrong the way you learn us any skill of any sort is focusing on what you did right uh, you have to know what you did wrong in order to learn it but that's not what you focus on correct It's nice to know, like sometimes we are doing things from a liberated point of view and um, 
maybe we've always done it that way, but uh, to help others, um, we experiment with doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so a good teacher knows how to uh, explain and understand uh, not only how to do it, but how uh, a particular style, how we do it uh, incorrectly too, right? So that's the path, right? The path is the mix of um, having someone practice from both points of view. Yeah. <laughs> Aaron? Um, I have a question kind of about examples yeah. of um, some experiences that I have, whether they constitute what you're calling contact. Um, okay. Like, for example, um, sometimes when I'm uh, either like on the phone with it with another person i'll get a very strong heart feels like heart emotional reaction to that person feels like it's right in my heart it's like grabbing my heart and squishing it and and i'm and i'll start often start crying talking to the person even though what they're saying doesn't necessarily um you know it's not like a thought is coming first it's like that feeling comes before I even have a thought or be, before they even say anything that that relates to why I'm having that kind of visceral experience. Is that a contact experience or is contact only like I, I and or and and I keep wondering about mind's eye versus I, I you know I, I. Um, um, is that contact or is, are these different things? That's a good question. Um, my guess is that that would be Vedna. You see, Vedna means feeling. So you've already, the contact already happened. Like re, just before it or, or so, so, sometime? Say, well, when, yeah, so if primarily you're connecting with the feeling tone, then you're, you're at the situation of uh, feeling. So the contact would have happened in a prior moment. And with that contact, does it really have to be like this eye consciousness or this ear? Could it be your mind's yes, eye could, or your mind's yeah, ear? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know, we actually have six senses. Mind is a sense. So, yes, yes. I, I've been yeah. noticing that more lately. I have, I'm not yeah. seeing it with my eyeball and I'm not hearing it with my ear, but I have like this this set this awareness of of this this mind awareness i guess that feels like an, right. a seeing with my mind and a hearing with my mind is kind of odd but so that's that's one of our senses yeah so um delhi you know what uh you know like talking about the these 12 madonnas or talking about five skandhas um I'm talking about sense spaces, everything is this Abhidhamma approach of learning to distinguish uh, the moments, learning to distinguish the situations so that they're not happening automatically and we're slowing them down and uh, seeing actually what happens. So how, uh, how do we slow them down? So we're gonna slow them down because we're all doing our shamatha practice right <laughs> so they go really slowly it's like you know uh abhidharma style is uh slowing the movie down so you see each frame <clears throat> okay yeah so Thank you. i think yeah it's like that <laughs> so um when when a movie is running i don't know what it's 32 frames a second or something to give you the illusion of mobility uh when we slow it down then we see that uh it's um, not a solid thing. Okay. Also, yeah. So the value of this is then at each point where we slow it down, we have the possibility of uh, liberating or becoming more entangled with it, right? So I liken it to, you know, playing dominoes. So um, <laughs> <laughs> it, 
well, not it's not really playing dominoes the game, but you know, if you line the dominoes up really close, all you got to do is hit one, and they all go down. So, a majority of dharma practice is uh, uh, developing space between the dominoes. So, uh, you could have just one fall, and it doesn't doesn't have to hit another one. And, and is the experience of when you're knocking them all down, that's when you get completely overwhelmed and delusional, correct? <laughs> yeah, we generally do. Yeah, we just, that, that's when it, you know, just becomes a reactive pattern. Okay. Like that. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's always a good question. Um, <clears throat> Hi. Andrew. Hi, Lama. Uh, so I was just thinking about, um, you know, from PTSD, uh, the flashback is, is a, a delusional, uh, you could say, mind experience that, that you're reliving uh, a situation. And so one of the, the therapeutic techniques is the grounding technique where you're uh, kind of attaching, if you will, to all five senses, or you're just noticing what you see, what you're hearing, what you're feeling, to kind of ground you in the present moment. And I was just thinking about, you know, you talked about shamatha and, and um, our, you know, not being like a breaking things down moment to moment. And I'm just wondering, is that kind of a similar process that you're doing with that grounding? Is that an Abhidharma style? Uh, where you're just noticing without um, so much clinging. Yes. So, uh, you know, the American mindfulness uh, approaches that are in psychology and in Spirit Rock is uh, uh, very much an Abhidharma style, right? You're, you're noticing the difference between a thought and a feeling and a sensation, and that's the Abhidharma style, right? With the idea that uh, uh, you're defusing the situation, right? So we are kind of like bombs. <laughs> so we want to defuse our bomb by showing that uh, these uh, discrete moments are happening, and uh, you know it's possible to um, separate them so they're not reactive patterns. Because the mind uh, wants to just instantly part. jump in. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, usually from uh, Abhidharma kind of approach is uh, things are, and Dharma approach too, things are fused, right? They're too solid. They're fused together. They're enmeshed. You know, so the, the metaphor, so to speak, for enmeshment is samsara. And uh, the the cause uh, is this misknowledge or fixity, right? So we're, much of Dharma is a deconstruction process. Analysis means literally, you know, agree to um, loosen up, right? So, um, you know, particularly in Dr. Goodman's presentation, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, he's ta talking about Atman or the problem is, you know, we're basically, uh, you know, fixated, right? You know, obsessively fixated like that. And uh, the Abhidharma approach shows that we're actually made up of uh, parts and threads. So it's loosening, loosening it up, yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's an extremely powerful approach, which is part of our um, path. But of course, um, the Heart Sutra uh, that we, spoke uh, a while back um, just takes the Abhidharma approach and trashes it. <laughs> so hello Abhidharmas, like uh, we're, we're uh, you're missing, you know, you're missing Prajna Paramita here as being um, the most important thing. Of course in Vasubandhu's Abhidharma Kosha uh, really prajna is the operative dharma, right? Um, but the prajna paramitans, if I could use that word, uh, say, you know, that's uh, really um, 
all you need. We don't have to go around, um, you know, distinguishing all these things. Uh, you know, likewise, and um, Mahabudra just uh, directly, or, or Dzogchen, just directly see nature of mind. You don't have to go around labeling everything and distinguishing it. Um, but as part of a, a, a path, um, usually uh, uh, we need to do that. We've, you know, we, we need to kind of demesh things uh, before we have uh, in a full intuitive grasp. What do you think? <clears throat> that seems to be the way it's been for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like that for most of us, yeah. Besides that, if you don't know what all those parts are, you can't understand the Heart Sutra. <laughs> right, it doesn't make any sense, yes. And generally you can't help others, you know. So, um, uh, you know, one of my teachers, uh, uh, you know, Chodji Telko, who's now in Denver, um, used to say, <laughs> he'd throw up his hands and he says, it doesn't tell anybody, it doesn't do any good for most people to tell them just to let go. Let go of what, you know? Uh, so uh, we, we, we generally have to start um, with, uh, you know, loosening things up and defusing them uh, before there's uh, direct recognition of the space. <clears throat> You have a question? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so my question is Dana. So you previously talked a little bit about how um, sometimes people create a box um, you talk about existence so much in, in a way of like a box and how we kind of have to form a box around us to keep ourselves from freaking out. And we create a box to kind of contain ourselves so that we feel safe in that box. Is the six, uh, six link here, is that the first part of the formation of the box? Like where the sense, organ, uh, sense faculties and objects um, are, are combined with consciousness kind of is the first freak out that we have in, in consciousness where those things are coming together and we don't, it's so overwhelming and so uh, um, disorienting that, that we have to like kind of give ourselves like a, a box to kind of contain ourselves in. Is that a good metaphor for it or am I completely? As people know out in TV land, we just have this uh, one mic. So eventually in our advanced improved, we'll, we'll have maybe multiple mics. We'll see, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> there, there is a sense that, you know, uh, these 12 links are uh, talking about the development of a human being too you know, just like a fetus and things like this. Um, <clears throat> but there is a sense where it's also talking about a uh, fully developed human being. And um, uh, sometimes contact is, is uh, talked about uh, as kind of a shock. Like, you know, the, the sense bases are building up, the birth has happened, the karmic formations, the intentionality, life force is there. And then uh, suddenly uh, you're, you've popped out in uh, an old style hospital birth, right? The, it would be cold, the lights are on and maybe someone slaps your butt, you know? And like, what, what, what happened? You know, so in that sense, uh, contact, uh, you know, is very painful, um, but, uh, Contact can also be, you know, a necessary structure to um, 
when understood to hold our experience properly. Like we can know like, okay, now we're in contact. So uh, we say that a lot actually in psychotherapy, like uh, particularly Gestalt style, like um, being contactful, right? Like are we looking, are we, are we in contact or is it, there's a disconnect, right? So the contact uh, can go both ways. The contact can be where we've solidified things and it's painful or the contact can be uh, liberating. In any case, uh, there's either an enlightened structure or um, some sort of structure. So uh, awareness in the Bajrana um, Buddhist world doesn't mean um, no uh, structure. There's, there's always a structure going on. It's just not a restrictive or a painful structure. But uh, the, from Tantra point of view, um, a regular contact with the senses is painful. So when we've done long retreat um, or even short retreat, you know, we've done some retreats at a Lotus View and then uh, I'm looking forward to doing uh, retreats in Carmichael and in Strawberry, right? That, um, which is really important. Like if people do some long retreats here, then um, uh, when you're kind of coming out of retreat, so to speak, it's just painful. <laughs> you know, it's like everyone's too loud. Everything's too loud. Everything's too fast. Um, we just want to tell everybody to quiet down, uh, move slower. Like, you know, uh, it's just, and we can see the pain in people's faces. So even more directly, like so many people just look really in pain. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing, you know, contact uh, as it actually is in a samsaric way. Because usually we think what's, uh, you know, the, what we normally is pleasure from light point of view is actually kind of painful. It's too rough, you know, like that. It's like the conversation or the touch is too rough. It's too, yeah, you know, like that. So uh, I like talking about samsara from, as a trauma model. Buddhism is kind of a trauma model, right? So. I'm sorry, isn't just dissatisfactory or um, frustrating. Um, I do agree it is dissatisfactory and frustrating, but uh, if we look very deeply, we, we should see it as horrific. So why stay, right? Like that, you wanna, you wanna really untangle it. It's nothing worse than having something in your eye, right? Like it's been windy in Sacramento, you get something in your eye. Um, Maybe if you belong to one of the martyr religions, you would think this is a good lesson. I'm, I'm learning something from having this painful eye. But from Dharma point of view, there's absolutely nothing to be learned from delusional suffering except to stop it. Nothing to be learned. There's no character building. You know, there's no, you're not, you know, thinking, well, this is a good lesson. No, you don't need any more of those lessons. So we're, we're not into abusive situations, right? <laughs> yeah, so contact could, could be um, like years ago when I was traveling for Sutter Center for Psychiatry, um, sometimes you had to stay at a different motel every night. And um, of course you have to get up in the middle of the night to do your thing. One time I thought I was in another place or in flat into the wall nose. Anybody ever done that? That's contact. And Cesara. <laughs> okay, what time is it? So then we need to go soon. So maybe uh, more questions. No, everything's good. Comments, complaints. So to all the people that I haven't met yet. You know, I look forward to um, meeting you. Uh, uh, so uh, probably at this point, um, you know, we'll be really opening up 
uh, in June. Actually, I think I'd like to wait until we do my birthday party, if that's okay, probably June 27th. And then, then hopefully we'll be even clear on um, health issues, right? And um, many of the improvements will be uh, done. And uh, you know, for the people that uh, will feel safe, they'll show up. For people that want to stay in video land, they can stay in video land that way, or they can't drive here. So actually it's just as good maybe in a way, right? I don't know. So <clears throat> I think you can do uh, now, you can do impairments remotely over video, right? So that's very Vajjana in a way, very visionary. So luckily we, we can be visionary, don't you think? So we can have a heart connection even when people are remotely um, Vajrayana particularly is designed for that. So uh, those levels of reality make it so we can be uh, distant but connected. So we should end with prayers. And so you're on, Elizabeth, Dina. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and leave all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chenrezig, Tenzing Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish and may the upholders of the teaching remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losong, Drapa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you. Very good. Some of you I will see in the future. Some I will see soon. So appreciate everyone's participation. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Lama. Thank yeah, you, Lama La. Zoom's yeah. working great, by the way. Zoom's working? That's good to know. Yes, yeah, Zoom is working much yeah. better than yeah. the Google stuff. So, yeah, perfect. Yeah. So, uh, maybe this afternoon, I don't know, maybe John is working on the Kala Chakra mural. Yeah, he'll come here at three. So, maybe we'll take some photos of that. Uh, and uh, maybe we need to post. Um, some photos of uh, the building and it's, uh, what's the color of the paint that we picked? It has a name. Yeah, we actually, I don't, is it what, uh, what, what make of paint? Yeah, Sterling Williams or what? Dunn Edwards. Dun Edwards. We, we have Dunn Edwards paint and the name of the paint is Lion's Mane. I thought that's appropriate. Ah. <laughs> Yay. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Stay in Goodbye. touch. Bye bye. Bye, Lama. Bye. Thank you, Lama. Thank, Thank, you, you, Lama. Thank, Thank you, everybody there. Thank you, Connor. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye bye. 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 <laughs>